Chapter 35 Cold Dawn Light I heard something about a town south of here being attacked. The details are sketchy. All I know is there haven't been any refugees showing up here, which means either the attack wasn't too bad, or it was very, very bad. Heroes. We all need heroes, children. Now, more than ever. It's a good fight that they're fighting, and they do it on behalf of us. But the equestrian wasteland is hard on heroes. No. It's brutal to them. It beats them down. It tears them apart. Eventually, every hero falls. Inevitably, every hero fails. Now, listen close, children. Heroes ain't machines from some equestrian robot factory. Heroes are ponies, just like us. Doing the things that we should do, or that we should be doing, because there ain't no pony else doing them. The true mark of a hero is not that they never fail, never fall down. I've said it a hundred times and I'll say it again. The one great truth of the wasteland is that every pony has done something they regret. Now, you know a true hero by what they do after they fall. By the way they pick themselves back up, again, shake themselves off, and throw themselves back into the good fight. Despite what they've done, and despite the bleak prospects of a happy ending. Sad truth is most heroes don't survive, or they become overwhelmed with the cruelty and despair, and disheartened, they give up. But in the stable dweller, the bringer of light, I've seen a hero of an entirely new tier. I was convinced, still am, that this heroine will never surrender to the wasteland, never give up. There is, however, one other fate that may befall heroes. When the horrors and the pain of the equation wasteland become too much for them, they can snap. They can turn into the very monsters they choose to fight. Sadly, children, they can happen to the very best of ponies. Even Fluttershy had her gardens of Canterlot. Now we don't know if that's what happened to our heroine of the wasteland, or if there's more to the story that we've been told. We just don't know. But I can tell you this. The pony who first reported the slaughter at Arbu was from Brooklyn Cross. Now that's a Steel Ranger's stronghold, and I got my reasons to take a critical eye to what they have to say. So I started doing some more digging. And I started that digging by trying to contact a gal I know at Buckland Cross. Riverseed, a trustworthy pony. Turns out, she ain't there anymore. No pony is. Buckland Cross, where our witnesses, or where our witness of the Arbu Massacre claimed to be from, is dead. Completely wiped out. Now children, I know this looks bad. Two communities in the vicinity of our heroine wiped out. I'm still holding on to hope, but I'd be remiss if I didn't send out a word of warning. Just on the chance that the equestrian wastelands facing a whole new kind of dark. So if you see a band of well-armed ponies, including a pegasus and a zebra headed your way, or a pegasus pulled passenger wagon flying near, until we know better, you best make your place, make yourself someplace else. But if the stable dweller should come to your door, don't lock it. Because if our hopes are true, then she's in more need of our help and our support right now than ever before. And if our fears are true, then, well, children, she just might see the locked door as a challenge. How bad? Calamity demanded. His not pushed up against Grandpa Rattle as the two bucks looked like they were going to kiss. I need to know, because I'm real hard, trying real hard here, to make sense of this, and it ain't happening. I love Lil' Pip, and I want this to be right somehow, but all I'm seeing is a group of folk who took us in, fed us, offered us shelter, and got slaughtered for their kindness. I wiped out a town, a whole town. I just killed murdered so many ponies. My rage had buried itself, uh, burned itself out, leaving me with an empty husk. 
I wasn't sad, or angry. If anything, I just felt hollow, and slightly confused. The events of the last... how long did it take? An hour? Less? I couldn't remember. My thoughts and memories were all jumbled and refused to straighten out. My comprehension of what I had done was as much from the evidence in front of me as my fragmented recollection of my own actions. They were cannibals, Steelu stated, not for the first time. You saw it yourself. The basement. Go! See for yourselves. That's what I had told them. My friends had caught me just after I stepped into Starbucked, but not before I started shooting. The colt was in there, Sandy Shore. I remember that now. They were at a dinner table, eating. Again. The bastards has already fed the boy his own father, and it wasn't enough for them. I remembered the fire pit, hot coals and flame, and the rod of iron with the twisted end that looked and shaped like the shape of the Arbu brand, glowing. In my rage, I assumed they were going to brand him, but in the wake of things, that didn't make much sense. And, I think, one of the other ponies there had been in the firefight against the bandits this morning. I remember that Calamity had been shocked and concerned as he watched me open fire. Velvet had nearly been hysterical. The basement, I had shouted. Go, see for yourselves. Ain't ponies here left worth saving, boy. Grandpa Rattle told Calamity, except for the kids. Any pony worth being called a pony left this town years ago. Found another way of surviving. You're still here, Calamity called out hoarsely. Some pony had to stay for the little ones, the elder buck replied, and to warn folk away. Calamity looked like he didn't want to argue that, but Grandpa Rattle continued. Every other pony here is a willing part of murder, and worse. Those who didn't, some went to Friendship City, or Gutterville. Some just joined up with the bandits. Hell, boy, half the folk you shot this morning used to live here. Clamity reeled a bit at that revelation. The little ones, the children of Arbu, were huddled together behind Velvet Remedy's shield spell. The unicorn friend had maintained the shield since the frightened or fighting started dropping it only when I floated a new filly or colt from one of the old stores. She hadn't fired a shot the entire time. Just stood there, inside her shield, guarding the children. By the time it come out of Starbucked, the colt and two fillies, in tow, the others had come out of the clinic. They had seen what I've done. But by then, it didn't matter. The rest of the town was awake, and they were shooting back. If it hadn't been for Velvet Remedy, the town might have killed its own children in the crossfire. Calamity had shot back in self-defense, firing to wound and to incapacitate. I remember his look of horror as I finished off a pony he had taken out of the fight through crippling. Stulus had also fought defensively, letting me enter each place first. But unlike Calamity, my ghoul friend didn't pull his bucks. Custard Pies was burning from the missiles he had fired. Something in the architecture must keep the fires from spreading, I thought because all of Arbu should have been burning to the ground. I looked at the children. They hugged each other, crying, terrified. Cowering behind Velvet Remedy, casting horrified and hateful looks at me, I stood there and soaked up their hate. I couldn't blame them. These poor children had just seen me murder their parents, their families. More than one had heard their mothers scream out, Rape! as I first ripped their clothing from them looking to see if they had taken the brand. I swallowed at the first feeling returned to my soul. Pain and self-horror at what I have done to these children, what I had let them see in the name of saving them. O oh, goddesses, what damage had I done? There were five of them in all, plus the colt whose father had killed, plus one young buck with them, not much older than a colt. He was old enough to have his cutie mark, but his flank didn't bear the mark of Arbu. He had eaten, knowingly, but he had been unable to bring himself to kill. I spared him. He could be saved. In the entire town, he had been the only one, save for Grandpa Rattle and the children. Even in my rage, I hadn't wanted to believe the whole town was vile. 
Surely, I kept thinking, there were at least a few more. Even just one. Now, listening to Grandpa rattle, I understood why. Except for the young buck, each and every attempt to find a redeemable pony had failed. Clemity turned, trotting towards Velvet Remedy, barely casting a glance my way. He stared at the unicorn, who had become his lover through the shield of magical energy she was maintaining around herself and the children. You said Lil Pip had a concussion, right? Could that explain all this? My Pegasus friend looked desperate. She's not thinking straight. Not herself, right? That could excuse this. Velvet Remedy stared back at him through the glow of her magic, eyes narrowing. She shouldn't need an excuse. I stared silently, watching my friends argue about my actions, taking sides. I was struck mute, like I was in shock. Only shock didn't feel this dead. My headache had returned. Actually, it had never left. But the pounding was getting worse now. Bad enough I couldn't ignore it anymore. Not even was all that was happening. Pardon? Pardon? Calamity asked, eyes widening. They were cannibals. Velvet Remedy snorted. Maybe it's hard for you to see, being so quick to eat meat yourself. But these ponies, what they have done is beyond evil. Hey, Calamity shot back, raising his voice to match hers. I get that they were cannibals. Puts them right up with the new Appaloosans on the list of places I ain't gonna settle down. And the fact they fed me, Pony, makes this place a place I would never come back to. I would never and would warn folks about. I winced. Calamity, equaling cannibalism to trading with slavers on the moral scale. But I wouldn't go slaughtering them for it, Calamity continued. As far as I can see, they only ate bandits. Raiders and the like. Ponies who need to be put down. Ah, Velvet gasped in expasperation. There are some things you just don't do, Calamity. I'm not a naive stable filly anymore. I've seen how hard the equation wasteland is. I know that you'd have to do awful things out here. Looting dead bodies? Okay. Killing? Monsters and vicious animals? All the time. Other ponies? Not as much as you like to, but yes. Even killing ponies is often is often and regrettably necessary. Velvet Remedy had been a stable dweller like me. She grew up with the same morality I did. Only, she'd always held onto hers better than I had. The wasteland began to erode from me the very first night I was out. A beloved sense of right and wrong had made her sterner stuff than mine. And what she had seen in the basement was so far beyond what she could accept. But you treat having to kill them with respect. You bury them. Or, if you don't, you at least don't dance on them and urinate on their corpses. And you don't carve them up for snacks. You do what you must to do to survive. Zenith intoned silently, or softly. It was the first thing she had said since the shooting started. Velvet turned her eyes on her, eyes wide. Are you seriously going to side against little Pip on this one, with the argument of cannibalism, yay? Unlike Velvet and Calamity, Zenith's voice only grew softer. You cannot begin to understand what I've let them do to me in order to survive. If they had put pony meat in front of me and told me to eat, I would have. It would not have been the worst thing I let them do, not even that week. Velvet took a stumbling step back from the dour zebra, turning to Calamity. They didn't just kill bandits, Calamity. You saw the herd of the preacher, head of the preacher pony. They had it mounted on their wall like a trophy. And if they murdered him, how many more? I reckon I don't know, Calamity replied. The point is, none of y'all really do either. They fed you the meat of ponies you killed. Probably fed you the heart of one of them, Velvet Remedy continued. Ain't happy about that. And they've been selling it to merchants, spreading their filth across the whole wasteland, Velvet pointed out, a hoof towards the children clutching from behind her. And they have be 
been indoctrinating a whole new generation to do the same. Velvet, I said softly. Too softly to be heard. Don't defend me, Velvet. You were right about me back in old Appaloosa. I'm the murderer. A monster drowned in the blood of all the ponies I've killed. I'm the thing in the mirror. No better than a raider. Except, I wasn't. Was I? These were bad ponies. They needed to die. I was saving ponies by wiping them out. Wasn't I? Corrupted kindness. The little pony in my head said angrily. Our boot wasn't a town full of ponies, Velvet Remedy asserted. It was a cancer that needed to be destroyed before it could spread any further. Velvet, I said again, a little louder. Calamity was staring at her in silent. Neighing loudly, Velvet exclaimed, Arbu was mutilating flesh that it had to be cut away in order to save the wasteland, and before it could even begin to be healed. Velvet, you're scaring the children. My voice was soft, but just loud enough for her to hear. The beautiful charcoal unicorn turned, aghast, tears forming in her eyes as she looked at the terrified expressions on the faces of the fillies and colts behind her. I'm not corrupted kindness. I won't put back at the mare in my mind. I don't believe it. Not anymore. Trixie had been right. Or, I had made her think. If you haven't found your own virtue yet, Monteria Jack told me, you'd best hurry up. Well, there's still anything left of you to save. Was there anything left of me to save? You just slaughtered over twenty ponies. The little pony in my head responded, What do you think? My head was splitting open. I realized I was crying. Calamity turned to Steel Hooves. Now, what about you? What about me? Steel Hooves responded, lethargically. Calamity shook his head. Is this... Is there a way for me to be okay with this? I want to be okay with this. For Little Pip, but... Little Pip is our leader, Steel Hooves replied. It was her call. It was... Calamity blinked, his brow furled under his hat. It... Oh, hell no! The Pegasus launched himself into the air, flying up to the Steel Ranger outcast. Steel Hooves stood his ground. The idea of Calamity intimidating a huge ranger struck me as ludicrous. You're the elder of Applejack's rangers now. You don't get to play the good old soldier car anymore, Calamity informed me. Tell me. Oh, what Applejack think of all this? Steelu's deep voice rumbled dangerously. Applejack was a farmer. What she didn't put into her friends and tried to save ponies, she put into her apples. She understood they needed to be rid of bad apples. And I think she would have been repulsed beyond the telling of it to see ponies eating other ponies. Clemity flapped his wings, moving back a pony's length. But, to kill them all? Steel Hooves whined. She wouldn't have done that. No. But she had other options. She could have had them all arrested, rounded up, and carted off to the Ministry of Peace, where they could be fixed. Calamity nodded. But, that's kind of my point. Little Pip had options. She could have come to us. Why didn't she come to us first? I was hating how Calamity was talking about me like I wasn't there. Like he couldn't bear to acknowledge me. But then, did I deserve better? Would I have been able to look at him if he had just done the same to me? She was enraged. She was not thinking clearly. She lives in form Calamity bluntly. The only thing she's done wrong here is that she let her anger control her. Is that what you need to hear, Calamity? Then yes. I don't approve. I would prefer she had killed the monsters with cold-blooded calculation. Steelers was right. Calamity was right. Right. I had totally lost it. But they were bad ponies. They were horrible ponies. They deserved it. All of them. The little pony challenged. Even the young ones. I tried to save the young ones. I rescued them but I had traumatized them in the process. Was what I had done any better than what the raiders did to Silverbell? 
Still, I'd only killed the responsible ones. The adults. The mayor in my mind spit back at me, asking, What about the young mayor in the clinic? My mind swam. I was still having trouble remembering everything that had happened. It was like trying to put together a puzzle while gagged. I couldn't hold the pieces of my hooves, and they kept slipping away. Pref, 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 pref. I remembered that much. Two through round bursts. One into the mother, and one into the father. I... I hadn't killed the young mare. Are you sure about that? My little pony was quick to point out. She's not here amongst the living, is she? Are you sure you didn't choke her to death? Were you even paying that much attention? I... I didn't. Couldn't have. Did I? And even if I didn't, what had I done? I left her lying unconscious next to the burning bodies of her murdered parents. So much less evil, little Pip. I was evil. But she wasn't a filly, I thought desperately, clinging to an illusion that I could keep. She had her cutie mark already. Stable think, the mayor in my mind chided. You were older when you got yours. She had her arbu mark. She killed and eaten. How do you know her kill wasn't just a damned rad gator? My little pony spat. She was a guard. The rifle under the table proved that. The arbu ponies had guests in their town. Guests they weren't going to kill. So, they had guards. Protecting their dark secret. Ready to kill to defend it. She was one of them. She knew the town, what the town was doing. And that it was wrong. And that she was protecting it. The little pony in my head shut up at that. For it, or what absolutely little worth it was, I had scored a point. Go up to my room, a voice behind me said. Grandpa Rattle had walked up to me at some point, and I hadn't even noticed. I felt like I was missing time. There's a safe under my bed. Fetch the book inside. I know you can pick a lock. I turned to him. It was like he was forever away. I had the sudden sense that I was drowning in this air around me. What's in the book? It's my ledger. Every pony they killed. Every pony they ate. Bob Remedy had heard him. Why? She asked softly. Why would you keep a record of something like that? Because I knew this day was coming, Grandpa Rado replied. And my mind ain't what it used to be, particularly in daytime. Velvet Remedy closed her eyes. A tear reflected the light of her shield spell as it trickled down her cheek. I didn't figure it would be folks like you, though, Grandpa Rattle added. Actually, he said, pointing at Steel Hooves, I figured it would be him. I found myself in Grandpa Rattle's loft, staring at his bed, and the scuff marks on the floor of the iron shackles that had been used to find, bind the old man to his bed. I remembered running through the fire in Custard's Cakes and galloping up the stairs. I lost my balance twice in the steps, feeling dizzy. I blamed the headache and the smoke. The loft was filled with smoke, forcing me to pass against the hot floor. The heat was oppressive, but the fire wasn't spreading up the stairs. The ceiling of the bakery below wasn't catching flames. I coughed. I'm trying to open the safe, but it was impossible. My mind just couldn't grasp the image of the tumblers. Every time I tried, my thoughts just got jumbled, fell apart. My head was like a railroad spike being hammered in my skull. I floated out my screwdriver and bobby pin. I would have to do this the old way. It was too hard. The lock was ridiculously difficult, or I was just too messed up to function. After breaking four bobby pins, I gave up. I just laid there on the floor, coughing and hacking, trying to still my head. The coolness of the water talismans was washing over me, buffeting me against the heat, keeping the room bearable. Why didn't you go to your friends first? The pony in my head would not let me rest. I don't know, I told her. Why didn't you talk to Grandpa Rattle? You could have gotten this ledger. You could have known for sure. But I did know. I had seen... enough. I had killed for those monsters. 
The Steel Rangers. Those poor ponies up at Buckland Cross. They didn't have to die. They didn't deserve to die. Not for Arbu. Especially not for Arbu. More memories came back. I could remember gunning down the milk-colored, one-eyed pony now. We helped you, she screamed at me as she dropped her shotgun, having run out of bullets. My mind flashed back to the Ponyville Bridge. I had not said, had I not said the same thing to Monteri Jack? You haven't been forced to give up your principles for the greater good, to sacrifice yourself and become the monster because it was the right thing to do. Red Eyes was no longer my dark and twisted reflection. He was my reflection. I was a monster. I hadn't even been forced. I did it because I was mad. If anything, he was better than me. No. No, I wouldn't be like this. I wouldn't let myself become this. I had made a mistake. A horrible, evil mistake. But this wasn't me. I was better than this. And I still, still could be. I had to find a way to make this right. To fix this. You can't fix dead. No. But I could spend my entire life doing everything I could to make up for it. I would... I was corrupt kindness. But I could be more than that, couldn't I? Was it possible for a messed up pony to have a true virtue as well? Yes, a voice in my head insisted. My memories flashed out to my last visit of that New Appaloosa, to Silverbell seeing Pyrelight, her eyes going wide with wonder as she suddenly saw a whole world had opened up to her, a world of beauty. The voice came out of nowhere. It was under E. Took a Philly's tone. I never felt joy like that before. It felt so good, I just wanted to keep smiling forever. And suddenly, part of me knew. Knew for sure. Call me crazy. But after we go, I half expect that Philly to spend the next few days trying to make New Appaloosa as pretty as that bird. That in that moment. Silverbell had found her virtue. A real one. Pure and true. And if the pony who had epitomized corrupted laughter could also become something greater, then so could I. My headache had faded. I glanced towards the window. The sky was getting lighter. Almost. A dawn was almost here. I'd been in this room for hours. How? How had I lost so much time? I pulled out another bobby pin. This time, I got the lock open. It wasn't nearly as hard as it had been the first time I tried. Howdy, children. This is your favorite voice of the airwaves, DJ Pwn3, bringing you the news. First up, Wander, a warning to travelers. The fires in the equestrian forest are creating a major travel hazard from Splendid Valley to New Appaloosa. And I'm not just talking about the air quality, <clears throat> although considering some of the things burning up in that place, that might be a righteous concern. No, I've got reports of some truly fearsome monsters that have been driven from the forest. Caravans are cautioned to steer clear of the whole region until further notice. And now, for a little something different. <clears throat> a male pony dropped by old DJ Pwn3 and gave me a letter, written from our dear Ditsy Doo out in New Appaloosa. Love that gal. Well, she was listening to the two reports I had made regarding the stable dweller and the news out of Arbu, and she wasted no time in weighing in. Here's what she has to say about the stable dweller. I've seen her get raging mad at what the raiders in Ponyville did to me, and to a filly, and to many others. She saw. She went crazy. She pulled out her gun and started saving ponies. I was one of those ponies. Maybe you too. The bullets she had fired are still saving ponies today, because those raiders aren't around anymore. I bet she saved a whole lot of ponies in Arbu. P.S. Yummy yummy muffins. Homage is awesome. Zenith is awesome. Little Pip is awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Took long enough, Grandpa Rattle grumbled as I returned with his ledger. Fall asleep in there? I set it down before him. I... 
Don't know. Well, I ain't got all day, he snapped, floating the ledger up. Dawn's almost here. It won't be lucid much longer. Velvet Remedy was curling up with the children, singing a soft lullaby. She'd gotten most of them to sleep. At the elderly Buck's words, she stopped singing, turning to him. What do you mean? Grandpa Rattle looked to her, without a trace of shame, as if he was too old and too weathered to be embarrassed about what he has to say anymore. Told ya, my mind ain't what it used to be. I've been kissed by Luna since I was old enough to have a cutie mark. Well, that couldn't help come down, come down. Kissed by Luna? I asked. My actions apparently having not killed my curiosity. Grandpa Rattle regarded me. That's right. Means I'm clearer headed and more perceptive at night. A blessing from the goddess. Recent years means the night time serves stays off the dementia. The old block floated his ledger out in front of Calamity. Well, you gonna read it or not? The rush colored Pegasus took at the book, floating in front of him, then shook his head, pushing it away. The book broke out of Rattle's levitation bubble, thumbing to the ground. I don't need to, Clemity said, walking past Grandpa Rattle, and up to me, staring at me. You did wrong, little pip. She says the pony who shot her because... Says the pony who shot her because he thought she was a raider. Don't matter what the book says, he continued. You lost control. I know, I said softly. Clemity lunged at me. I stiffened, too startled to react. He grabbed me crushing me. I tried to fight back, but he was bigger, stronger. He was hugging me. I've seen your heart, little pip, Clement reminded me, clenching me tight. I know you're a good pony, maybe the best pony I've ever met. I felt his tears. If that heart cries out in pain, in rage and fury, then I've got to believe it's for a good reason and that I'm just too jaded to see it. The early morning breeze washed through the sky bandit. Six children, one young buck, and Grandpa Rattle all accompanied us, scattered about the benches of the passenger wagon. This was the second time in 200 years that it had felt full, even though there were still plenty of empty benches. Bob Remedy had been nothing less than an amazing in getting the foals to come along with us. We were taking them to Friendship City, some place that could be safe. Surely a place called Friendship would take them in, and if they needed persuading, I had a water, water talisman to offer. Now, Velvet Remedy's attention was on me. Her horn was glowing as she looked into my eyes. If it would make you feel any better to claim temporary brain damage, I could probably give you a doctor's note, Velvet chided. Your concussion was less than 16 hours ago, and what you've done since is pretty much the opposite of rest. It's at least three days flat till Canterlot. I reasoned. I'll rush on the way. My headache was back. Although not as bad as before. I hadn't been able to eat. But I really didn't want to. I wasn't sure if I could ever eat again. I would never put meat in my mouth for as long as I lived. Velvet nuzzled me softly. But you shouldn't. Never need to use excuses for yourself, I mean. You didn't do anything wrong. She took my face in her hooves and made me look into her eyes. I know you, little Pip. I can see that you've been bucking yourself to pieces about this ever since it happened. Possibly even while it was happening. You're not a monster. You're not a villain. You're a mare who loves ponies and cares about them, and who finally had seen too much hurt too badly to stand it anymore. Goddesses, if only we were all like you. Velvet? Something in her voice worried me. She looked down, dipping her horn. If anything, or if any pony is a monster here, little Pip, it's me. What? No, that's... Yesterday, you killed a bunch of ponies who were murdering and eating other ponies, she said softly, a tone of real sorrow in her voice. Yesterday, I put the life of my pet above the life of a pony. 
I shook my head quickly. And now it was my turn to make her look into my eyes. You put the life of a beloved member of this group, a thinking and feeling creature, above the life of a pony who shot her. Votem gave me a wet, grateful look, but said nothing. What are these marks? Stilus asked Grandpa Rattle. Clemity may have neglected the ledger, but the leader of Applejack's Rangers was giving it a close inspection. So what now? Grandpa Rattle asked. Hey, how'd you get my ledger? You gave it to me, Stilo said evenly, patiently. Oh, he looked around. We're leaving Arbu, aren't we? It's not the first time Rattle had seemed surprised at the change in his surroundings. Yes, Stilo said. Now, if you please, what are these marks? Grandpa Rattle peered at the ledger. That there is how many times I warned folks off before the others killed him. One mark for each time I told him, I have a shotgun. I see. For him to keep such records of his attempts to help, seen him close, was sprang to me. I suspect he was not expecting rescue at all. He was preparing his defenses. Grandpa Rattle turned his appraising gaze to steel hooves. You're him, ain't you? Steel hooves looked up in the ledger. Excuse me? You're pallid and steel hooves, he explained. I remember you. You're that ghoul my daughter kept lusting after. Velvet Remedy's eye, ears perked up. I stifled a laugh. Steel hooves nickered and tried to turn his attention back to the ledger. You must be mistaken. No, you're just none too perceptive, Grandpa Rattle insisted. Never knew she was even there. Always pinning for Applejack. Steel hooves looked up abruptly. Do I know you? Scribe Rattle. Grandpa Rattle paused. Former. Left after my daughter got pregnant. As Steelhoof's quick stomp, Rattle swiftly added, Not yours. With that buck, what's his name? From Arbru? Steelhoof's cocked his head slowly. Scribe Rattle. Transformation magics. Abandoned the rangers after your daughter was disgraced. I remember now. Grandpa Rattle's expression darkened, but he nodded. You knew transformation magics? Zenith asked. Yep. Steel Rangers was trying to figure out a spell to turn Steel Ranger armor into clothing and back. Wouldn't work, I told him. Armor's already full of spells. He looked suddenly eager. I could change your rifle into a stick if you'd like. I've got a shotgun. <laughs> I do not have a rifle, Zenith pointed out. Oh. He turned to me. How about you? Can you change it back? I asked. Uh, no. He had a stick. Looking past him, my eyes caught one of those young, that young buck that I pulled out of Java Cup. The young buck had been staring at me, silently, since laying down on one of the Sky Banis benches at the start of the trip. You have no Arbu mark? I recalled asking him, my heart almost giddy with relief. No. He had told me back, told me back into a corner of his room. Last week I was supposed to kill a mare and eat her heart, but I couldn't. I'm sorry. I know I was supposed to, and Daddy was furious. He. Then his expression changed to a flash of hindsight. You killed Daddy, didn't you? There had been such a look, an odd look in his eyes. It wasn't blame. It was resignation. Now for the first time since then, he spoke. What happened to Clear Glass? It took me a moment to realize that he was talking about the other pony in Arbu of similar age. The young mare guard. The mare I hadn't intended to kill, but who I was sure now was choking that I had choked to death without even thinking. I cringed, looking for words. I killed her. The voice wasn't mine. I turned to look at Steel Hooves in surprise. Coming up on Friendship City, Clementy called out before anything else could be said. 
This time, let me do the talking. Love whatever you said to Steelhooves. Your diplomacy leaves a lot to be desired. The ghoul nodded wordlessly. The events of the night before were weighing heavily on him. And for him, Arbu was not the heaviest burden. I got up, steadying myself, as I was hit with an odd dizziness. It passed and I moved to the window, staring out at the Pony of Friendship, a huge statue made of green metal that stared out over the Manhattan Harbor. Living inside that metal statue, surrounded by water, was an entire town of ponies. I could see lights pouring through the tiny holes where the metal had rusted through. Friendship City. I was thrown against one of the passenger wagon's benches as Calamity banked to hard left, dodging the sot. shot. I can't believe Friendship City is shooting at us. Smaller pops were followed by a massive crack of thunder below us. An explosion of black smoke and flame burst through the air a dozen yards away. The ponies firing from the crowd from the crown windows of the Pony Friendship <clears throat> were not much of a threat, but the shells from the harbor artillery were a whole different matter. You haven't been listening to the radio, have you? Steelo grumbled. Your friend DJ Pony 3 has some unpleasant things to say about the massacre of Arbu. What? Another shell burst in the air. Clemente veered harshly, throwing me again. Velva put a shield up around the children to keep them from getting tossed. We can't land here, Clement shouted. I've got to go back. Sounds like one of those two rangers you let go at Buckling Cross reported Arbu in the worst possible light. Still has informed me bitterly. He was dying inside. I was dying inside. Homage. Oh, goddesses. What did Homage think of me? Did she hate me? I have them recorded, if you'd like to listen later. I wanted to gallop to her. To order Calamity to head to Tempony Tower straight away. But, but I couldn't. I was already delaying for too long. We needed to go to Canterlot to deal with the goddess. And to turn our attention to Red Eye. Right now, thousands of ponies were in danger just from Red Eye's throat alone. And I was surely already testing his patience. I remember thinking, in that one brief moment of memory, that I had kept for myself from the helping of Clinic and Tempony. It was the only way to make sure Red Eye listened. I had communicated with Red Eye somehow, presumably through some pony or griffin in his encampment. I hoped that I had been convincing him that I had a plan, and that I just needed time. A lot of time. More importantly, how much needed the truth? The truth she could trust in. And I was the last pony who would be able to give her that. She needed to learn what happened from a source that was not biased as I was. If she learned the truth, it couldn't be from me. Anything from me would be tainted. And if she did not, or worse, if she did and hated me for it, it would kill me, but not like a ghoul. But like a ghoul, I would keep going anyway. If I lost homage, I was losing something that I didn't deserve. And if the whole wasteland turned against me, if everybody feared and hated me, it wouldn't stop me from trying to make Equestria a better place, even if that meant I would forever be seen as the villain of the peace. Clemente flew us away from Friendship City. We waited an hour after landing in the Manhattan ruins, then worked our way towards the harbor on Hoof. The rest of us stayed behind, watching from an observing platform, as Velvet Remedy led the survivors out onto Friendship Bridge. Her horn was glowing. Behind her floated Elder Cottage Cheese's life support capsule. Pyrolite perched on top, enjoying the ride. Friendship Bridge was a drawbridge that had once extended all the way from Manhattan to the island. I was astounded at how close to intact it was. There were gaps, but none looked longer than a hundred yards, and there were rope bridges spanning the collapsed sections. How do they do that? I mused, staring at the extensive rope bridges through my binoculars. It seemed like an incredible feat, even for unicorn magic. How many tapped my shoulder, then grinned, fluttering his wings. Oh, duh. At some point, Friendship City had become home to at least one Dashite. 
Through my binoculars, I could see that the ponies of Friendship City had fouled the Manhattan half of the lifting bridge, locking it in a flat and a re-engineered their half so that, I could only con that only they could control it. As I walked, Velvet Remedy Grandpa Rattle and the children approached the far end of the Manhattan side. It had to be Velvet, and it had to be her alone. BJ Poem 3's warning of painted, painted zenith and calamity as signs of danger, and only Velvet Remedy had the diplomatic skill to talk to the ponies of Friendship City into letting the survivors in. Well, not exactly alone. She had Pyrolite. I suddenly reminded of how much solace Pyrolite gave me in Philadelphia. In the crumbling ruins of the buildings behind us, Zenith was talking softly with steel hooves, as she was building a cook fire. You were swift to condemn those who eat the meat of other ponies, she said softly. I'm a ghoul, he replied. And I'm a zebra, she responded back. And unlike the medical pony, a vegetarian. Yet, you took greater offense to the survival tactics of Arbu than I did. Why is that? Zombies eat the flesh of other ponies, because they are monsters. The zebra nodded, sagely. I see. We watched, and waited. They were far away, but I thought I could see Velvet Remedy lifting her hoof. There was, I had been told, an intercom that would allow her to speak to the guards on the island, if they were willing to listen. Sulu's moved up next to me and sat down. Calamity. Mind if I talk to little Pip alone? Clementy looked at him for a moment, then nodded and flew off to where Zenith was cooking. I looked at Steelhoofs nervously. Clear, ga clear glass? I asked slowly. You sent a merchant pony, an innocent, into a basement. A place where he could be easily cornered, even though you had left one of the guards alive. He responded. Us as well. It was not the sort of tactical error you it was a sort of tackle error you wouldn't have made if you were thinking clearly. He looked at me. And that's how I know you were not. I closed my eyes and looked away. Take the pain slowly, he told me solemnly. What you became last night is going to hurt you for the rest of your life. I nodded. Part of me wanted to cry. But I would not let myself, because the tears would have been for me. And I didn't deserve them. The ponies of Arbu didn't deserve them either, as much as my actions horrified me. Showing me the monster I could and briefly did become, there was no question that Arbu needed to be purged. Just like any pit of raiders or band of slavers. And if any pony deserved my tears, it was for them, so who I have saved. The night had cut a deep wound in me. An abyss carved into my soul with a blade of my own wielding. That great hollowness festered with despair and self-loathing. I was slowly filling it with determination. Sulu stared over the harbor. I need to thank you, little Pip. For what? For failing, Sulu said, surprising me. All this time, you have been some pony to look up to. You have made me want to be the better pony. But at the same time, you were too good. He looked at me. You are an impossible standard. Tonight, you have made it easier for me to live with myself. I just stared. My heart twisted, unsure how to feel. A drop of rain hit my horn. Another splashed against my nose. Stulus turned away, staring out across the harbor again as the rain began to fall. Eventually, I did too. Raising my binoculars, I caught Pyrolite flying towards the island, carrying something. The ledger. I knew. Good evening. This is DJ Pone 3, and I've got news for you. Major update on the situation in Arbu and Buckland Cross. My associate spent the, spent the last few hours talking with a merchant who was at Arbu, and saw much of what went down. First and foremost, let me say, hallelujah. Sounds like our wasteland survivor hadn't fallen into the darkness after all. Maybe stumbled a bit, but listen to this. The ponies of Arbu were cannibals, folks. That's right, they ate ponies. And as if that wasn't sick enough, they've been selling pony meat, claiming it was rad gator meat. 
Eating a rat gator kebab lately? You sure about that? The great goddesses. And I. Thought I'd seen that fucked up shit the Swissland had to offer. Well, it turns out our stable dweller discovered the truth. Unfortunately, here's where things get sketchy. See, when our heroine showed the merchant what she had discovered, the good pony hightailed it out of there and didn't look back. But what the merchant can tell us was that before the shit went down, the ponies of Arbor were treating our heroine to a meal and a place to sleep. And yes, children, you guessed it. What was on the menu? But before she knew the truth, our heroine tried to help the ponies of Arbu. She went to Buckling Bridge to negotiate for clean, purified water for the town. And the rangers on that broken bridge started firing at her heroine before she even got into shooting range. Or shouting range. According to the merchant, it was quite the light show. I don't know about you children, but that gives me new suspicions about what happened at Buckland Cross. And it puts some serious questions to the witness from Buckland Cross, who first reported the events in Arbu. I'll let you know more as soon as we do, children. But for now, I think we can all breathe a heavy sigh of relief. And now it's Sweetie Belle, singing about the one great truth of the wasteland. It rained for the next two days straight. Water was still falling from the sky, in sheets, as we flew over the foothills that slowly climbed up towards the base of the mountain. Dark cliffs shot up abruptly to loom over the landscape. Somewhere up there, obscured by the rain, were the ruins of Canterlot, the former capital of Equestria. We were all soaked to the bone, but calamity had suffered by most, the most by far. I shivered from the cold. My armored stable barding was pasted to me like a second skin. The fur of my coat trapped between it and my real skin in a most unpleasant way. But still, I was better off than I had been in these days. This morning was the first thing, or the first, that I had been without headaches. For the first time in days, I felt I could actually think clearly. Above it, I only proclaimed that my concussion was gone, but still wanted me to rest. I had been doing nothing since, but resting since we had returned from Friendship Bridge. Alone, save for Pyrelight. Friendship Shitty had proven good to its name, and taken in the refugees from Arbu, and cottage cheese as well. They hadn't asked for any payment, any conversation. They just wanted to help. The white ponies were supposed to. I had sent Pyrelight to them with one of the water talismans. Not as payment, but as a gift. The other water talisman was now safely installed in Stable 29. Star Paladin Cross Rhodes had been talking about rebooting the Crusader when we left. With the override codes, Cross had convinced was convinced that they could rewrite the Crusader's programming, turning it into an obedient and beneficial custodian. She still hadn't decided what to do about Buckland Cross. Steelers gave her some advice, but left the decision up to her. I believe some diplomatic failure had left him wanting to distance himself from that place. I stared at my four hooves. As we approached Cantalot, a new concern had washed over my mind. My pit buck. We were supposed to take everything off before we entered. Our armor. Our saddlebags. I was still supposed to float all of it. But you couldn't float a pit buck. Well, you could. But all you would have is a fancy radio. It had to be attached for the EFS and SATS to work. Not to mention the medical assistance and auto mapping. I could take it off. I had the tools. But without it, I'd be a fraction of my uselessness in the most dangerous place I'd ever set foot hoof into. Could I do that? Was it right to expose my friends to even more dangers because I might otherwise be forever bonded with, well, my cutie mark? Keep your ops peeled for a safe place to put her down for the night, Clement called back over the roar of the rain. To be honest, none of us were as concerned about safe places as we were about to dr as we were about dry. We all moved to the windows. I was about binoculars, but they did little good. They just made the gray of the rain closer. Suddenly, Stulu's galloped to the front of the Sky Bandit. A moment later, he turned to me. Little Pip, can you get me on the roof? Can you stay on the roof? Velvet asked, concerned. Even with the mounting? What's wrong? I asked, 
even as I kicked on my EFS, it answered my own question. With my targeting spell, I could recognize several hostile targets, at least a dozen were airborne, and three friendly ones on the ground. In a second it took me to count, one of the red marks passed over one of the friendly lights and extinguished it. There were now only two. Calamity, I shouted as I drew up my sniper rifle. Get us as close as you can. We need to see what we're shooting at. Floating up the sniper rifle, I slid into sats and took aim at the shadowy flying figure I could not clearly see. The targeting spell, however, didn't give a damn about the rain, and my EFS was quick to identify the targets. Bloodwings. A whole damn flock of them. Attacking two fleeing figures on the ground. As best I could tell, they were completely unarmed. I opened fire out there, determined not to allow that number to drop any further. Hello out there. Any pony awake? It's time for a special late night edition of news. I have with me, communicating over broadcaster, one Grandpa Rattle, longtime resident of Arbu, and new citizen of Friendship City. He's here to set the record straight. The whole pony about what went down three nights ago. So sit down and hold on to your hats, children, because this is going to be one hell of a story. But first, I have something I want to say. And this goes out from me to that here one of the wasteland, our little bringer of light. I'm sorry. When you've seen as much as I have, when you see how many heroes fail and fall, <clears throat> it's hard not to expect it. It's hard to keep believing. Even when you know there's some pony out there you should believe in. You didn't fail a stable dweller. I failed you. And you have my deepest and sincerest. A particular toaster repair pony once told me that she would always be tuned in, listening to my messages of hope. Well, listen close, stable dweller, because this is the honest truth straight from me to you. That message of hope, that's you. You are my message. Now then, Grandpa Rattle, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and this book you wanted to share with us tonight? Ain't a book. It's a ledger. A recording of every sick thing the ponies of Arbrew did. By the time I'm done reading page two, I guarantee every one of you you wish you could be there to do what that little mare did for you. Footnote. Level up. Mac I mean, maximum level. That's what I meant. Sorry, guys. <laughs> God. This little short one has been rather nice compared to that long one I just did. Uh, see you guys Monday. <laughs>